we've arrived in 2023 in a situation where the more progressive you are, the more likely you are to support jihadism. You know it's true. Jeremy Corbyn called Hamas his friends. Yeah. He visited the Hamas leadership in Gaza. Mm. He uh, visited Hezbollah in Lebanon and called them his friends too. He worked for Iranian press television. Now, maybe he doesn't support jihadism, but there is this phenomena called the Red-Green Alliance, isn't there? That's, that's been, that people have been talking about in the last sort of five, 10 years, by which the further left you are towards the hard left, the more likely it is to be, you are to be friends with people on that end of the spectrum. Jake, thanks for joining us. Um, before we get into the substantive issues and your book, Israelophobia, um, tell us who you are and what you do. Okay, well, my name's Jake Wallace-Simons. I'm the editor of the Jewish Chronicle uh, and the author of Israelophobia, as you've got here, the newest version of The Oldest Hatred and What to Do About It came out on September the 7th, so exactly a month before October the 7th, mm. uh, weirdly enough. Uh, I've been editor of the Jewish Chronicle for a couple of years. Uh, before that, I was on Fleet Street for a long time. Uh, I was a foreign correspondent for some time um, and uh, have worked across, mainly across, mainly in print, Daily Mail, uh, Sunday Telegraph, Times, uh, and as a freelancer for Guardian um, back in the day, and as a broadcaster for BBC and, 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 and CNN. Yeah. Mm. We, I always, um, talking about sort of journalists who, you know, worked on the papers and stuff, I always wonder about whether or not hack is a compliment or, or, or an insult. I, I don't know what your position is on that, but I, whether or not you'd be happy to be described as such. Hack works. <laughs> hack take works. it, we'll hack take works. it. Um, we're gonna talk about your book. We're gonna yep. talk about the developing situation um, in Israel-Palestine, the, the war that's going on at the moment. I, the first thing to ask before we get into any of that is about your friends and family um, and if they're okay and, and how you've been over the last month. Well, I mean, I think it's a case of degrees of separation. Uh, and for me, I haven't got any direct friends or family who are killed or missing or injured. My uncle's going out, has gone out to Israel now to volunteer there. So I've got people and I've got some extended family in Israel. Um, but then if you go one step away from that, friends of friends, friends of family members and so forth, there's quite a lot of people who, uh, who I know of mm. who've been directly uh, affected. And look, it's been it's been intense. There's there was the initial trauma of of October the seventh, which is still playing out. But then there was the added trauma of the response to it in Britain, mm. uh, by which people raised the Palestinian flag before the blood was dry. And there's nothing wrong with raising the Palestinian flag, but the context was felt to be mm. um, a level of sympathy for Hamas. Uh, that sort of, it, it was it, it, it was as if the events of October the 7th were played into our own identity politics, how we feel about ourselves, almost like a football match. Yeah. It, people weren't really relating to what was happening, uh, but, but more to how they can show people who they were. Mm. Uh, and that was very dispiriting. And we've seen the marches going on uh, each, each week, which are very uh, intimidating and, and, and worrying. So it's, it's a difficult time. That's a... Um... I'm glad to hear that your, friend, your friends and family are okay. Um, and I think that's as good a jumping off point as any to start with the sort of the domestic side of this here in Britain. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the protests that have happened. I think there were some, some really quite ugly. I think you were right about, I think it was the day after, wasn't it, a, a sort of action outside uh, the embassy, Israeli embassy, which is um, incredibly ugly. And you're, you're so right as well to sort of talk about this in the sense of the tribal, tribalism about it. So little now of our politics is, is about finding the consensus and the commonality, and it's more about posturing your identity, whether that's as a liberal or as a conservative. And one of the things that's most upset me about this conflict is the way in which, from whichever side it is, the sort of the callousness that one side has treated the other, the horror of October 7th, you know, the horror of what's happening in Gaza at the moment, I find both so affecting, and I really struggle with people who can't empathize or, hu or humanize with, with this? Yeah, I mean, in fact, funnily enough, the, the one person who I didn't mention when you asked me about my friends and family was my friend in Gaza, uh, who, I've, who I've been speaking to more, yeah. funnily enough, than anybody in Israel, just, be, just because. Um, we Where about are they? How are they? Uh, he's gone down to the south right. uh, with his family. Uh, he's an old colleague from when I, from when I was a foreign correspondent. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and he's, I mean, initially in, in the shock, he was, uh, you know, just barely able to speak and wasn't sleeping and very tired. And now it feels like there's a bit more stability in, in his in his world. Um, mm. But I don't get to speak to him that often. So I spoke to him, I think, two or three days ago. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the protests then. I mean, we've seen several large uh, protests. I think you, you'd have to say now hundreds of thousands of people have demonstrated over successive weekends. And obviously there's the conversation in the British media at the moment about the upcoming march on the Saturday, uh, which is Armistice Day. Maybe we'll get to um, talk about that a little bit in a moment. But first of all, your reaction to these protests that have happened so far. Um, I don't like how do you feel as a question about this because it's quite woolly, but obviously there's a lot of people saying they've been inti felt intimidated, but there are obvious, genuine and serious questions about freedom of speech, uh, right to protest, etc. that these, these marches are provoking. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not one to call for banning things very easily. Um, it's against my, my instincts, really, and particularly when it comes to protesting. And I've always, in, in my book, as you, as you know, I've been very clear that it's perfectly legitimate and, uh, and, uh, and authentic to march for the Palestinians in normal times, to raise the flag, to their flag, to campaign for their cause. That's perfectly, I'm not denying that that's a, a respectable thing to do. But what we've seen these past few weeks has been of a different order. You know, if you go back to the Oslo Accords, when there were demonstrations in favour of that, in favour of peace, the chant that they used then was peace now, mm. peace now. And if the demonstrators were chanting that, I'd have much less of a problem. But instead, they're chanting about globalising the intifada, which means basically bringing suicide bombs to our streets, so far as I can tell, um, or could be seen to mean that. Mm. Um, they're chanting about from the river to the sea, which again, could, could be seen to mean that Israel should be dismantled entirely. And some have even been chanting in favor of jihad and other things. Uh, there isn't any sign of call for peace. Nobody seems to mention the word peace. Nobody has shown any concern for the Israeli side. So you talk about the tribalism, the one side or the other. Um, and there's been civil unrest, there's been violence, uh, thankfully not too much so far, but it does seem to be coming to a head with each further week. Mm. Um, and so it does feel to me that these marches are not really uh, coming from a place of good faith on the whole. Um, uh, and, and particularly as many of the people organising them have links to Hamas. Mm. So I think, um, I think you struggle to find someone in Britain, right? Well, there, are, there obviously are about because they're they're chanting jihad, right? But I think, let's say, call it 90%, 95% of people in this country, you said, you know, do you agree with the concept of jihad? And in that sense, by the way, I'm talking about the, the definition of it as, you know, holy war, armed yeah. struggle, violence, rather than the sort of more spiritual uh, definition that is available if we're talking from a theistic one. 95% of people are going to go, absolutely not. What are you talking about? Um, and there is this, an element to this, isn't there, that... Every political movement has its fringes, its freaks, its extremists, who make no bones about their hatred of Jews. It is unfair, though, isn't it, to characterise a march of, for the sake of argument, let's just say it's 100,000 people, to say that all of those people are extremists. I, I bet you a majority of those people there are just people who feel a degree of sympathy with the Palestinians have turned up for the march. They've got no idea what, you know, uh, Johnny come lately, who also has a bit of a thing for Hamas, is doing there, who he is or what he's doing. They're just there to show that they're empathetic and they support the Palestinians, surely. I get that. I get that. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, it's interesting how few of them made any statements of solidarity when the Jews were killed. Um, and that's, for me, that's one of the giveaways mm. about how it's not really about the victims. It's about the cause mm. and what that means for them politically. Um, you know, when Muslims get killed by Assad, he killed, I mean, he barrel bombed Palestinians in Yarmouk a few years ago. What's different this time? It's not the victims, it's the perpetrators in their mind, it's the Jews. Mm. There's a qualitative difference there. Um, having said that, I'm not saying that everybody on the march are extreme, is, is an extremist, mm. don't get me wrong. But I think that there's a moral wooliness there. And it's quite a subtle thing. I mean, like I mentioned, I've got a friend in Gaza 
uh, compassion for the innocent civilian suffering in Gaza is entirely, I mean, I don't even need to say that it's right and any human being would feels that and feels it strongly. Um, but I think that that common decency to feel compassion for the sufferings of Gazans as well as the sufferings of Jews um, can sometimes become so intense that it clouds common sense. Mm. And what I mean by common sense is understanding that war is hell. And even a just war and a defensive war is equally as hellish as every other war. And it doesn't matter to the woman in Gaza whose child has been killed in an airstrike whether the, the war was just or unjust. Fine, I accept that. But I think from our point of view, we need to recognise that when we've gone to war in World War II, for example, it, we caused untold suffering to civilians, to German civilians. In Dresden, we firebombed and, and burnt alive 25,000 civilians for the sake of damaging German morale. Mm. It wasn't a military target. Yeah, absolutely. You know, many, many more Germans were killed than Britons. Does that mean that it wasn't a just war? Mm. Sometimes there's a just cause. And, uh, and to hold those two things in mind, compassion for the innocent victims, and yet still recognising that sometimes a nation does need to, to invoke the hell of war, is, is the mature position and the right position. But it's quite a hard one to hold because, it, you know, because the strength of your common decency can sometimes just sort of cloud your, your, your judgment about the, the tragic necessity of war. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something that gets lost, isn't it? The way that people posture about these things, um, the, the sort of the, la the la just lack of humanity and the horrors of what's happening, it gets lost in the conversation. I'd like to, um, if we have time, I'd, I'd certainly like to talk more about proportionality and, and, and that nature of what's going on at the moment. But just to, to come back to you about uh, the demonstrations on, on that yeah. point. I understand, and I think you're right, actually, to highlight that there are some people who are marching that you're right, it's all roads lead back to Israel. It's because the Jews are involved that they are taking this cause so seriously. There's also a question as well about the way in which we, um, the way we simply care about news stories. I, I, this is, without lifting the curtain too much for the audience, you know, being a bit of a sort of cynical journalist about it, people care more about massacres that happen closer to home. And... I think a lot of people in the West, certainly, you know, Israel is a democracy. Uh, Israelis are racialized, it's white. They see common cause with the Israelis and therefore um, that story gets a lot more play than perhaps, let's say, the civil war in Congo where millions of people have died. You know, absolutely atrocious. Does that lead the bulletins? No, it doesn't. Simple fact. I wonder if, though, the reason for this wider political expression in relation to this is because the British government is not giving full-throated support to one of the factions in the Congo, to um, the Chinese and, and the, what has been called genocide widely and that they're inflicting on the Uyghurs. It's because the British government is not saying China has a right to do that. Again, I'm, I want to be absolutely clear, I'm not drawing an equivalence between the treatment there and what's happening in Israel. But it's Britain's political association with the Israeli government that's drawing out this kind of political protest, is it not? I think I think there's some truth in that, <clears throat> um, but let's compare it to another conflict when we when when we took part in a coalition to uh, destroy Islamic State. Mm. That was a conflict that wasn't just people who looked like us or had a democracy that was like us. It was us. The RAF was 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 flying over Mosul, dropping bombs. Mm. Battle of Mosul is a good example. Twenty was it seventeen eighteen something like that. Yep. Um, the city was besieged. Islamic State were embedded amongst the civilian population. The RAF and the American Air Force and others bombed it, and then the Iraqi forces went in, resulting in the deaths of 11,000 civilians. How many marches were there during that period to call out, to use a common modern term, to call out our complicity in the deaths of 11,000 innocent Iraqis? Mm. The answer is zero, because we knew that Islamic State, having beheaded David Haynes and others, um, James Foley and others. We knew, having, you know, having, uh, Manchester Arena was later, it wasn't at the time, but there were terror attacks that they'd carried out, including many that I covered as a journalist on the ground, the Bataclan, I was there, Nice, Stockholm, Berlin, uh, even Istanbul, Sri Lanka, I was there, all those that I covered on the ground. 
We knew in Britain that they had to be destroyed and the only way to do it was via waging war and that meant the deaths of civilians. It's the same here. People say, well, it's, it's Israel's fault because of the occupation. This sort of woolly term, what does that mean? We don't know. Because of the occupation. Because Gaza's an open-air prison. Well, Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005. Gave the, Gaza, the Palestinians living in Gaza the keys to their kibbutzim and farms and businesses in Gaza. Not only that, but then even after Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, in an effort to prop up the regime to prevent a humanitarian disaster and to add a degree of, of, demo, of, of uh, economic stability in the naive belief that that would reduce the terror risk, allowed 10, between 10 and 18,000 Gazans into Israel every day to work. Up until October the 7th, that was happening, to bring economic stability to the Strip, provide the Strip with water, even though it sits on, on top of an aquifer that if Hamas had used its fund to tap that rather than build terror tunnels, they could have you know, given their population sufficient water, fuel and all, all the rest of it, internet, we've seen all those things. So Israel did everything it could from 2005 onwards to, for, for humanitarian reasons to, to provide the Gazan population with some stability while Hamas used all of its funds to build terror tunnels and, and develop the inf infrastructure of death. Hamas didn't build one bomb shelter for its own civilians, not one. Yes, there was a military blockade at sea, of course. And we know why, because otherwise what happened on October 7th would have happened a long time ago. So the idea that Israel had it coming because of the occupation, there was no occupation of Gaza. It's just, it, it's, it's factually untrue. Mm. Um, and so what we see is not uh, some kind of expression of freedom fighters, they didn't have it. I mean, they had. They were given their freedom since 2005 onwards. What they chose to do with it was to was was to was to, to grip the population in this in this regime of jihad. Mm. That's the problem. It's it, you know Hamas has a common ideological root with Islamic State and with uh, and with Al Qaeda in the Muslim Brotherhood. At least that you know uh, you can trace that back. It's part of the same ideology. They all want a worldwide caliphate. It's jihadism. And just how we fought it in, in Iraq and Syria, and we fought uh, against Islamic State, it's the same foe. And so, but, but look at the difference in response to our public, from our public. If you compare, you know, when we sent our boys into action in RAF planes, and when the Israelis go against the same foe in Gaza. To your mind then, let's, I'd like to explore that point about um, occupation and the definition of the term. Yeah. To your mind, what do people mean then? when they use that word, when they say the Israeli occupation, when they talk about Gaza being an open air prison, you, I, I think we were at, you were talking about this just before we started recording, so that uh, was the reason why I mentioned it here. What do you think they're getting at? If, if to, as you've just stated, as you, as, as you say, that Gaza is not occupied, so what are they talking about when they say it? What do they think they're talking about? I think th there's a reasonable argument to say that there is an occupation. Um, and what that means is on the West Bank. Uh, the West Bank is this sort of weird place that's frozen in time from the Oslo Accords because the Oslo, it was divided into areas A, B, and C. Areas A and B were going to be the basis of a Palestinian state and it all collapsed amid an intifada. And so it's a patchwork of different, um, of different areas, um, is, Israeli towns, cities, villages, interspersed amongst Palestinian areas. There are checkpoints. You could say that's not, people say that's an occupation. Um, it isn't an occupation like in Tibet where the Chinese have taken over, forcing everybody to speak Chinese, preventing them from wishing the Dalai Lama a happy birthday, raising a Tibetan flags illegal, kidnapping their children and sending them to re-education uh, camps to, to, to make them Chinese. It's not that. Mm. The Palestinians have their own government, their own security services, their own law courts, their own healthcare system. You know, so it's, so it's, but you could argue that that's an occupation. If people mean that and they want to oppose that, then that's perfectly reasonable. You know, it's open to debate, but it's perfectly re a reasonable point. And I don't, you know, I don't think that that's in any way illegitimate. But I think that if you ask people what they really mean by the occupation, often if you ask them which bit of Palestine is occupied, the answer often is all of it. And that means something quite different. That means that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. It should, it should never have been created in the first place uh, uh, and should be dismantled. And I mean, that, that question, I think, about anti-Zionism is an interesting one. 
in my mind, if you talk about being an anti-Zionist, before the establishment of Israel, I think it was a reasonable position to hold. Israel shouldn't, you know, many Jews, there was a debate about whether establishing a state of Israel was the right solution to centuries of persecution that had been suffered by the Jews. But after Israel's been established, for me, it feels like the difference between speaking to your wife or girlfriend about whether you should have an abortion uh, or killing the child when it's five years old, 10, when it's you know six months old, now 75 years old. It's different. The child's been born. The child's living. It's in the world. It's a person like any, any other person. It's a country among other countries. And God knows the history of every country is steeped in violence and injustice and bloodshed. Uh, do I need to mention about our own history? I don't. The American history that's founded mm -hmm. on a genocide of indigenous people there, the Australian history, the French occupation of Algeria. I mean, come on. You know, while, you know during this, while Israel was engaging in these various wars that have become iconic in people's minds, Six-Day War, you know, Britain had an empire. Mm. You know, the Malayan emergency happened around that sort of time. And there were pictures that emerged of Royal Marine commandos holding up severed heads of Malaysians. You know, Vietnam happened around that time, where hundreds of thousands of civilians were wiped out by the Americans. You know, so there's this. So that's what I mean by the double standards or demonization of Israel. Mm. That Israel, um, you know, the, the the quote in the beginning of my book from Jabotinsky, he says that uh, as one of our first conditions of equality, we demand the right to have our own villains, as everybody else has them. Everyone's allowed a villain apart from Israel. You know, like those those. Um, Recently on the West Bank, while this has all been happening, those deplorable Jewish fanatics have been trying to attack and shoot Palestinians, try to inflame the conflict there. They're, I mean, beneath contempt, those people. They're villains. Mm. You know, every country has them. It doesn't mean that the country itself is villainous. It doesn't mean that because Israeli police brutality exists, just as it does in America, just as it does in France, just as it does, dare I say it, in Britain from time to time, including stop and searches of, of, of black kids at, at school being, being, you know, being uh, strip searches mm. of, of, of black kids at school being a controversy that, that British police are facing. Um, but when it's Israel, suddenly it's because the country is illegitimate. The country has no right to exist. It's because it's sort of contaminated by virtue of the fact that it's Jewish. Mm. That's what it boils down to in the end. I really, I really struggle with um, people on the left who take that position. I mean, obviously everyone does. It's not just <laughs> it sound like it's just me who has a problem with it. Um, but you know, we sort of, if we're going to sincerely say Nivida, if we're going to sincerely say never again, the horror of the extreme right and what it can do, the brutality, the extermination of the Jewish people. If we, if we want to sincerely oppose what the Nazis did, as everybody should, you, you find yourself, I, the, the, the abortion comment you made was deep, you know, deeply provocative, but also deeply thought, thought provoking, right? It, it's in, in two ways provoking this, the sort of taste, but also in terms of thought, because if you sincerely want to say Nivida, if you sincerely want to say never again, okay, so what is your solution? The one we have right now is that Israel exists. Are you genuinely saying that Israel doesn't doesn't have a right to exist? Because because if you are, that for me, it's not a philosophical position. It's not a, polit a political position that is sustainable or, or can be held. Also, a little line as well. It's it's very easy, isn't it, to sort of sit in the ivory tower and say, well, actually, the politics of the state of Israel are deeply contestable, blah 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 blah, blah without experiencing the kind of um, the history. That Israel's experience. Yeah, I mean, this this right to exist business. I mean, what gives America a right to exist? What gives Australia, as I said, a right to exist? What gives China a right to exist? I mean, you know, there's what gives any country a right to exist? It's only Israel that has the, that right mm. question, despite the injustices that are that, that are in the history of every country. And I think that people from on, on the left uh, need to ask themselves: How is it that we've arrived in 2023? in a situation where the more progressive you are, the more likely you are to support jihadism. That's a, that's a very powerful thing to say, isn't it? Do you think that's true? Do you think it's true? You know it's true. On a broad basis, I, I think it would be unfair to suggest that the more left-wing you are, the more socialist you are, the more you support jihadism. I think you're 
you're talking in reference to what's happening in Israel, right? When you say that, you're talking, you're, you're, it's, you're saying that basically because the more left-wing you are, the more sympathy you have with the Palestinians, the more uh, justification people feel for the actions of Hamas. Is that, is that, that's the line of logic you're, you're arguing here. You're not, you're not suggesting that you know, someone who's a socialist finds common cause with ISIS or Al-Qaeda. I don't, am I following you correctly? The further left you go, the more progressive, you know, from the, from the mainstream moderate left to the hard left, the, the further you go on that journey, the more likely you are to support jihadism. It's right. just the truth. Could you, could you um, yeah, expa- I mean, expand on that? Well, Jeremy Corbyn called Hamas his friends. Yep. He visited the Hamas leadership in Gaza. Mm. He uh, visited Hezbollah in Lebanon and called them his friends too. He worked for Iranian press television. Now, maybe he doesn't support jihadism, but there is this phenomena called the Red-Green Alliance, isn't there, that's, that's been, that people have been talking about in the last sort of five, ten years, by which the further left you are towards the hard left, the more likely it is to be you are to be friends with people on that end of the spectrum. And the reason is because the people on the, on the hard left in particular refashion these jihadis in their own image, as it were. I mean, you've had Judith Butler, famously, the, the, the feminist Judith Butler, uh, on, there's a video of her circulating from 20 years ago where she said Hamas are a left-wing progressive movement. People want to see Hamas as a bunch of freedom fighters. They want to see them in that way because there's this a sort of hard left idea that even if the downtrodden uh, are... Um, um, are authoritarian and are brutal and are anti-democratic, it, they're still the, ro- the right ones to support because they're against the power structure, because they're against, you know, the white capitalism or whatever, whatever you want to call Probably it. Probably colonialism. Uh, yeah, colonialism, well, yeah. And so I think that there is, so the, the, the harder left you go, the more people's instincts tend to be with the underdog, even if they happen to be jihadis. And that's what we see at the moment. I mean, you know, there's, uh, there's videos circulating on Twitter of, of, of people on the left saying, you know, Hamas aren't that bad. Surely they can't have killed the baby. That's got to be a Jewish lie. You know, the, these guys, they, you know, they, they were pushed to it. They were pushed to, to, to rape, mutilation, murder and kidnap. Uh, they were pushed to, you know, playing with the heads of the people that they'd, that they'd decapitated. They were pushed to it by the white man, by the colonialist Israelis, by the occupation, you know. Um, it's this sort of... Um, it's, a, it's a, a symptom of seeing the world uh, in terms of ideology first and reality second mm. and trying to make reality fit the ideology rather than the other way around. I'm not condemning for a moment everyone on the left. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's bad to be on the left. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. Mm. Uh, don't get me wrong. Please. Uh, all I'm saying is I'm talking about the tendency that the further you go to the hard end of the spectrum, the more likely you are to do touch with reality. So is it your view then that the sort of... That ex- that you call it extreme, hard left, far left, whatever. That that end of, of the political spectrum, uh, sort of in, inhabits, well, not reality. That those beliefs, your 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 contention is essentially that those beliefs are a, a luxury or or an extension of. You don't have to inhabit a world where you suffer the consequences of, let's say, fundamentalist Islamist terror. Therefore you're comfortable to make common cause with those people. Is, is that kind of the, am I summarising your line of argument accurately there? Or? I think so. I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's, it's funny you use the word luxury. There's this, there's this term luxury beliefs, isn't there, that Rob Henderson came up with, the American commentator, that describes a suite of beliefs that are held um, as indicators of social status, not necessarily authentically held values, but more like a Cartier watch or something. Um, and, and they tend to include radical views on gender, on race, on sexuality, slavery, colonialism, our own history, and Israel-Palestine. And people tend to hold all of those. You quite, it's quite unusual to get somebody who's got, who mixes and matches those because they tend to be uh, expressions of, of quite elite social, social status. Um, and I think that the, the, the word luxury is an interesting one because they do indicate... Uh, that there's some sort of uh, narcissism or complacency there that's detached from 
the real world. And I think that you see that nowhere more clearly than in the Israel-Palestine conflict, because that is a war. It's a war. Like the wars that we fought, it's a war. Uh, you know, Israel finds it feels like it is under existential threat. And if it's not now, it's a whisker away from being under existential threat at the moment. Look at ourselves, how we behaved when we were under existential threat. 9-11 happened. That wasn't even in Britain. Mm. That was in the United States. And nonetheless, we took part in the invasion of Iraq in response, killing about 200,000 people in three years. Now, up until October the 7th, the sum total of people killed in all of Israel's wars in 75 years was 86,000. Seven, in 75 years, 86,000 people. We and the Americans and our allies killed 200,000 people in three years in Iraq. And that wasn't even existential for us. Mm. The last time we faced an existential threat was probably World War II. And again, as I mentioned before, we you know, firebombed 25,000 civilians without any military value. That's where it pushed us to. So let's not wag our fingers from sitting here in our, in our, in our luxury apartments in London you know, banging on about about you know transgenderism and 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 flying rainbow flags and 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 raising the Palestinian flag and going on about Hamas and wag our fingers at the Israelis saying, oh, you're, oh no, Jews shouldn't be doing that, you know, because we're, as Saul Bellow put it, Israel is being called upon to uphold a moral burden that everybody else has dumped. I find the example of um, Iraq and Afghanistan instructive. Because whilst it may make for a um, emotive speech moment for George W. Bush when he stood in the ruins with the bullhorn, whilst it might win him an election, and I think there is actually just uh, also, to, it's not just electoral politics, there is something more central to our ideas of nationhood and self that, you know, someone has wronged us, we will take vengeance, you know, and rightly or wrongly, we're going to Afghanistan, we're going to Iraq, etc. For me, hindsight is twenty twenty. The the debathification of Iraq, I think, quite directly leads to ISIS. You have all of these military trained, capable people disillusioned with the West, etc. Um, the, the, our recent withdrawal from Afghanistan, 20 years of suffering, bloodshed for what the Taliban are back in control there. I look at the legacy of those Western involvements, interventions, and I don't think they're glowing. And whilst in the immediate term, I, th I think you're absolutely right to say, you know, woe betide the American in 2001 that said, I don't think this is a good idea. The, you're talking about, obviously there were dissenting voices, but you know, still essentially a, a pariah for, for making that kind of argument. Surely we can't be looking at that emotional response, the one that says we we're going to take vengeance. We're going for revenge. I, I, that feels to me like learning the wrong lesson. No, no, I, don't get me wrong. I, I marched against the Iraq war. Uh, it's actually pretty much the only political march I've ever, I've ever gone on without being a journalist covering one. Mm -hmm. um, and I still would do that again. I, you know, I, I, I didn't think it was a good idea, and it wasn't a good idea. And it led to a huge amount of destruction. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not saying that that the that the uh, that the Iraq invasion was right, and therefore the Israeli response to Gaza is right. What I'm saying is, look how we behave. Look, look what we do mm. um, when we come under attack. Yep. Now the Israeli situation is entirely different from 9/11, because in Israel it's not about vengeance. I'm not saying there isn't an instinct to vengeance. Of course there is. That it would be, you know, inhuman to. That's human nature. But the thing is that for, you know, for, for decades, Israel has lived with Hamas on its border mm. and Hezbollah on its border in the north, knowing that they have the capability to mount massive attacks and yet hoping that they won't by a, a combination of deterrence, carrots and stick, deterrence and economic stability, as, as I described previously in Gaza. Mm. And what October the 7th has shown is that that is naive, that's complacent. You know, you can no longer have an enemy on your border with the capacity to cause such havoc to your civilians and live there and hope that they won't do it because sooner or later they will. So the Israelis have to respond. They have to clear that threat away. 
No, no nation on earth would tolerate that kind of threat that would, that, that's, that's demonstrated itself with the massacre of more than you know, 1,400 civilians and then let them be. Mm. Nobody would. It's an unreasonable expectation from any country. You know? And so to hold Israel to that, that re ridiculously, that the, it's not even a high standard, it's, a, it's an idiot, idiotic proposal. Um, and then demand ceasefire to, you know, to pull your troops out or to, to, before finishing the job is, honestly, it's cloud cuckoo land. Uh, was it um, Golda Meir? If, um, if, if the Arabs put down their guns, there'll be peace. If the Jews put down their guns, they'll be destroyed. So that's yeah. a paraphrase, I think. Yeah. I mean, look, Israel has the capacity to conduct a genocide of Gaza. If it wanted to, it could obliterate the entirety of Gaza. You know, it's got weapons of mass destruction, oh, yeah, shall nuclear, we say. Nuclear weapons. Use, which, uh, but it's not doing it because it has principles that prevent it from doing so. Mm. Hamas don't have that capability, mm. but if they did, they would use it. There's, um, there's an asymmetry there, isn't there, which I think char characterises a lot of um, modern conflict, that, that there is often a sort of hyper-powered, technology-based faction versus... Um, versus opponents that don't have the same capabilities. And that leads to, obviously, um, variance in tactics. So the Exactly, of... but I think the thing we need to recognise here as well is that everything we've been talking about is part of the, 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 the calculus of Hamas. Mm. They put their civilians in harm's way. They want the Israelis to kill their civilians. To because, entrench the conflict, is that...? Not to entrench... Well, to, to bring people out onto the streets in the West to inflame international opinion against Israel, to prevent Israel from having the support it needs to kill its enemies and to establish its security, to undermine it further, to perpetrate another massacre. We've seen that. I mean, when Hassan Nisrallah, the, the Hezbollah leader, gave his speech on Friday, he said, I salute those marching for, in the West for Hamas. I salute those guys on the street because they are working towards preventing Israel from responding. Mm. We saw a, an interview with a, with, with a Hamas official last week as well, where he said, if we had a chance, we'd do the massacre again. I mean, come on. Mm. You know, people are being played. People are going onto the streets with sometimes, as we've said, with, 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 with proper compassion that's right. But that compassion is being weaponized by the bad actors of Hamas to work against uh, Israeli self-defense and ultimately work against the values that we share with the Israelis as well in the service of jihadism. So our compassion is being weaponized by jihadism and people become, I'm afraid, useful idiots. Let's move uh, the discussion on. Do you think that Israel's response to October 7th has been reasonable and proportionate? Yes. Could you explain why? Well, look, like I said before, um, war is hell. And I wouldn't want for a moment to suggest that I or anybody else should lose touch with, uh, with despair and 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 compassion um, for the horrendous suffering that we've seen. Um, let's take as read that that's common to all wars. Um, Israel is is has no choice but to eliminate Hamas. There is no choice. It cannot continue to live with Hamas on its border, given that it's shown what it can do as soon as it gets a chance. Hamas has got to go for the sake of security uh, of Israel citizens. Hamas is putting civilians in harm's way in order to provoke Israel to killing the civilians. We've seen even reports of Hamas preventing civilians from fleeing after the Israeli Defence Forces have, have uh, warned them that they're going to attack, to, to cause the civilians to be killed, to create international pressure. Proportionality in warfare, I'm no legal affairs expert, but from what I understand it, is that the, uh, are your actions proportionate to achieving the military objective? You know, every strike that Israel carries out is gone through many times by lawyers, I think 11 or 12 times out of the Air Force said recently, um, to establish that, it was, that it's a military objective that is justified and there's no alternative but to, but to, take, but to take that action, even though Hamas have filled it with, with human shields. I mean, traditionally, Israel, you know, outside of wartime, when there's been terrorism and, and the sort of response that's been necessary to create deterrent, has called off strikes again and again and again because civilians are there. Um, and it's killed civilians as well. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but Israel is, is really operating in an impossible uh, 
environment because, like we know, uh, Gaza is one of the most densely populated areas of the world. You're against a, uh, an enemy who uses civilians as human shields. But ultimately, the, the Gaza needs to be free from Hamas. Israel needs to be free from Hamas, and the world does too. And so it's, you know, it, it pains me to have to make this argument, but I'm, I'm afraid there is no alternative for Israel but to defend itself in that way. Okay. Um, does the collective punishment of Gaza further those military objectives? What do you mean by, by collective punishment? Uh, the laying siege, to use the parlance of the uh, Israelis, the, the restriction of electricity, fuel, water, etc. Well, I mean, siege is a legitimate weapon of war. You know, we laid siege to Mosul, as I described earlier. You know, sieges are a, a, an ancient technique of war. Um, and, but according to the British Army's rules of siege, you know, you give the opportunity for civilians to leave um, and, uh, and you do your best to protect them. But ultimately, siege is, is a legitimate technique. Um, Israel, as far as I can see, has uh, given assistance to, to Gazans uh, to move out of the way of the fighting. And of course, it's messy. And I'm not saying that, you know, maybe it's quite possible that Israel has acted uh, in some cases, outside of the rules of, uh, of warfare, because stuff happens in war. But by and large, uh, Israel is, is, is doing its best, as far as I understand it, to follow the rules of law uh, and to protect civilians. Um, and I, I don't, you know, Israel isn't risking its soldiers out of a sense of wanting to punish Gazans or kill civilians. It wouldn't send its, its boys in to be, to be killed for the sake of gunning down civilians. It's trying to get rid of Hamas. And it's, and it's yeah, it's, it's messy and horrendous. Um, my final question, it seems sort of quite cheap to be honest with you to talk about, to ask you about this in, in relation to the, the stuff that we've been talking about, but it's something uh, you recently tweeted and then deleted, but I, I, I do have to ask you about it. Um, several weeks ago, you tweeted, we need to face reality. Much of Muslim culture is in the grip of a death cult that sacralizes bloodshed. Not all, but many Muslims are brainwashed by it. That's a big part of the problem. Do you still still stand by those remarks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, I uh, I think the the phrasing is a bit was a bit clumsy. Uh, what I was trying to express is a point that I stand by. Uh, I was uh, commenting on scenes of jubilation and celebration in the streets uh, across the Palestinian areas and the wider Middle East in response to the October the seventh uh, massacres. And what I was saying is that. Uh, these people coming out onto the streets are in the grip of jihadism, jihadi ideology, being brainwashed by jihadi ideology. So what I did not mean <laughs> was that Islam is a death cult. I meant that elements of Islamic society are in the grip of the death cult of jihadism. And I think I phrased it perhaps in a way that people were able to read it in bad faith, to be honest. But mm. um, I absolutely did not mean to denigrate Islam at all, or Muslim society as a whole at all. That was not my intention. And I think it's clear from the tweet, if you read it accurately, um, but what I did mean is that jihadism is a death cult. And unfortunately, it has gripped a lot of people throughout the Muslim world. And that is demonstrably tr true, um, and it's appalling. And, you know, we and moderate Muslims and people from all walks of life uh, from all backgrounds with a decent moral compass need to stand against jihadism. Mm. That's my point. So um, I really regret that it was taken as, it, uh, as, it, as if I had said that Islam is a death cult because I do not believe that. I, it, that's not true. Islam is a wonderful world religion that's got huge treasures and is, is commendable and beautiful and has bequeathed to the world a great civilization. Um, and, you know, as a foreign correspondent, I've traveled a lot in Muslim countries and have a lot of Muslim colleagues. I, I just, I feel like I'm kind of saying I've got Muslim friends, yeah. but I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that, is, that, is that Islam is wonderful. Muslims are wonderful. Jihadis and jihadism is a brainwashing cult and that must be uh, destroyed. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for having this conversation with me, me, for having it in good faith. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.